Everyday Sellers, it's Suzanne A. Wells, and welcome back to another episode of eBay the Right Way. And this is episode number 17. The weeks are clicking by fast. (laughs) In addition to the usual and maybe unusual commentary, we're going to circle back to my series called Pandemic Aftershocks where we will look at how COVID-related changes are affecting back-to-school this year. I've got some really interesting stuff and some input from teachers about how it's going to be different and how that can help you in your sourcing and selling efforts to know what's needed this year that's different in previous years because in 2020 back to school was very different masks were still being worn and the protocol was pretty strict for those school systems that even went back in person a lot of school systems still had shelter in place, and the kids didn't even go back until after Christmas. So we're going to talk about all that and enlighten you on how it's going to work this year, and that might help you sell more stuff if you know what people need. So we're going to start off with a YouTube update, and I posted a $100 supersize sales video a couple of days ago and received a comment that I wanted to reply to and expand on. So in that video, I show sales of $100 or more that are posted on my Facebook group by real sellers just like you. People that are out in the world finding these items and they're selling for sometimes thousands of dollars. And the whole point of the thread is to educate so the average seller can learn more about what sells for $100 and more because those scores are great. I mean, think about it. If you sell one item a week that's for $100, and maybe you pay less than $10 for it, that's a pretty good chunk of change for the smaller at-home picker reseller. So one comment was, I don't see this caliber of items in my small town area. I'd have to travel to wealthy neighborhood thrift stores and yard sales. And I just want to bust that myth (laughs) that there aren't good things in areas that are seen as not affluent, especially if you're looking at vintage items. So this comment about not being able to find items that will sell for $100 or more is really more of a knowledge problem than an inventory problem. And here's where people just don't know. It's just really ignorance. They think they've got to go to the rich neighborhoods to find stuff that's going to sell for a lot of money. And if you watch those $100 supersized sales videos, That's not the case. It's not all designer clothing. It's not designer shoes and handbags and, you know, expensive sunglasses and stuff like that. It's it's stuff that's very surprising. It's like some old kitchen thing from the 70s that is even broken that a collector wants. It's... It's stuff that just is hiding in plain sight that is there for the picking if you know what it's worth. So I think this commenter just doesn't understand that these $100 sales aren't what 
the average person would assume they're going to be. So I responded with, I think you need to change your thinking and your strategy. The caliber of items, question mark. You can sell old crappy looking stuff from the 70s and 80s for big money because they are vintage. They have collectible value. But the average person doesn't know that. They don't know that a automobile repair manual for a 1975 Volkswagen Beetle could be worth $200. And maybe the cover's torn and pages are missing. It doesn't matter. If somebody collects Volkswagen stuff, they're going to want that. Or maybe some salt and pepper shakers that were made in Japan and they're little um, clowns and maybe they have a chip in the side of one and on the bottom it says made in Japan and somebody collects salt and pepper shakers and this happens to be a rare one or maybe somebody collects all clown stuff which is totally creepy because clowns just creep me out but you know they don't care. They want stuff for their collection. Things like old TV guides, Sears catalogs, JCPenney catalogs. Some of those sell for over $200 because they don't make them like that anymore. And if you are Baby Boomer or Gen X, you grew up looking at that JCPenney or Sears catalog. And like in my family, we had four kids, and when that Christmas catalog came, we each got a turn to go through it and circle what we wanted, and it was just like the world was your oyster. I mean, I circled all kinds of stuff that I never got, but at that point, you had hope. You know, maybe you were going to get it. Um, with four kids, you know, we had a pretty big Christmas, but we always got pretty practical stuff. We didn't get real expensive items. But, you know, it's the nostalgia attached to these items that make them more valuable. Um, I've started rewatching that 70s show because I found the entire box set of the DVD collection at Goodwill. And that 70s show is not on streaming anywhere. So I've gone back to finding DVDs of things I like to watch. And um, I just look in the background the whole time. I'm like, oh, look at that old lava lamp. Oh, look at that t-shirt Hyde is wearing. Or, you know, Donna's shoes. Or um, the stuff in the kitchen is just fascinating to look at. And I really don't even pay attention to the characters anymore. <laughs> I go into uh, reselling mode and just look at stuff in the background. But that's what people want. They want to relive their youth, their teenage years, when they were 20-ish, and young, and um, it was an exciting time, you know, that's what people want. So if this commenter on YouTube assumes that you have to go to affluent neighborhoods to find items that will sell for a lot of money, I just want to say right now, that is 100% wrong. <laughs> that is just a false assumption. That is a misconception because it's all about what you know. And if, you know, you are an expert in, um, let's say, woodworking, let's say you do remodeling and you know all about tools and, you know, you're in Goodwill and you spot something Sears Craftsman from the 70s and you just automatically know that's going to be worth something. Or, you know, maybe you're into cooking and you know all about cooking gadgets and you know how to recognize the old stuff, um, like the old Pyrex, that those patterns were discontinued and that stuff's really valuable. So that could be anywhere, you know, the person it came from doesn't have to be affluent. Um, and as a matter of fact, small towns are some of the best places to find vintage items because, you know, I lived in a rural area for about six years. We lived on a farm in Tennessee outside of Chattanooga. 
And those people up there have been in those houses their entire lives. Those houses are 80 to 100 years old. And all the stuff that has come into those houses has been sitting there all this time. So finally, the person who owns the home passes away and it's too old to um, remodel. Maybe they're going to tear it down, maybe not. But a lot of that stuff gets donated because they've got to clean the house out. You know, things like old John Deere keychains that can sell for $100 because it's got an old logo on it. Um, just all sorts of things like that. So I hope this little speech <laughs> has um, hit a nerve if you think you have to travel to an affluent area to find good stuff. That's incorrect. What you need to do is educate yourself on what sells for a lot of money that doesn't look like it's expensive. That's where you need to do the work is learning so you can recognize these items. And a lot of those are in my Bolo handbook. So if you don't have that, you want to pick that up. Um, that's going to help educate you and flip that light switch on so that you can now see the light <laughs> about what kinds of things have value. It's not all designer clothing and sunglasses and high-end handbags and jewelry. It's, it's the other stuff that is just hiding in plain sight. So that is my speech. Okay, moving on to what happened in my eBay store this week. I had an amazing sale. I sold a Dunkin' Donuts tie. I think I mentioned this somewhere along the way is something I found. And it was $3, $3.18 to be exact. And it wasn't on sale. It wasn't the half price color. But what was interesting is that it was orange and it had a little Dunkin' Donuts um, logo and coffee cups on it. I mean, it almost looked like a uniform tie. You know, some businesses provide that. But um, it was by Vineyard Vines, which is a higher-end brand. That Their ties are, are fun and unusual and have cute patterns and wildlife and flags and all kinds of uh, nautical stuff, and they're really fun. So we have an unusual pattern by uh, for a well-known company made by a high quality brand and it was brand new and so I did purchase that brought it home did my research and could not find another one like it online anywhere not on Terapeak going back 365 days nowhere on Google Images I went to the Vineyard Vine site and looked for it um, I'm guessing it may have just been a special order for uh, executives or something like that because there was just no photos of it, no information on it anywhere. So I thought, hmm, I've got something unusual here. I'm going to price that high. And I priced it at $149.97 because other logoed ties from big companies like that, uh, that's what they were priced at. Maybe I could have gone higher because it could be a collectible, but I was okay with that. So it took about a month to sell, but it did sell for full asking price. You know, it was one of those sales that just no negotiation, no offer, no questions, just boom, there it is on your phone, item sold, ready to ship. And interestingly enough, uh, Dunkin' Donuts was, their headquarters is, I think it's Quincy, Massachusetts. Anyway, this went to a city very close to that in Massachusetts. So, um, you know, here I am down in Georgia. I find this unusual, obscure tie with no information, and it sells for full price and goes right back to the city where the company is headquartered. So that was a cool sale. <laughs> um yeah, that was fun. I was happy about that. Uh, 
And then what else did I sell? Just basic stuff, swimsuits. I sold some wallpaper border, uh, a Brighton belt that went for $35. It cost me three, um, which is another perfect item for my business model because it's small, easy to ship, doesn't take up much room, isn't going to expire, uh, well-known brand, Brighton. So that worked out. Um, you know, just some, some random things like that. So it was a pretty steady week, and I cannot complain. Okay, moving on to something new I learned this week. And I actually learned this about an hour ago. <laughs> I took a break from recording this podcast to take my packages to the post office and run some errands. And one of those errands was picking up my new prescription sunglasses from the Walmart Optical Center. Yes, that is the latest old person thing <laughs> I've done is get prescription sunglasses because I just, I don't wear my contact lenses to the pool or to the beach. And I just thought, you know, it'd be really nice to have that also for driving all these trips I'm taking now to go visit friends and stuff like that. So I thought, you know, I'm going to invest in a pair of nice prescription sunglasses with the UV ray protection. So I went to Walmart a couple weeks ago, and they were actually having a sale, a clearance sale, on some of their more expensive sunglasses, and there were some Ray-Bans in there, which I've never had. I have never had a pair of sunglasses that cost like over $10. I just never spent that kind of money on myself. So I was looking at those, and the employee said, oh, well, we have a deal going on. If you get a clearance frame, then the prescription part, the lenses are free. And I was like, whoa, where, where do I sign up for this? So went ahead and, you know, did the deal and cost me $145 for a nice pair of Ray-Ban Wayfarers with my prescription. So when I went to pick them up just a little while ago, <laughs> the girl was checking me out and she's like, oh, do you want the original glass lenses that were in these frames that we took out to put your prescription lenses in? And the first thing that went through my mind was, oh gosh, I bet I could sell those on eBay. And I was like, yeah, sure, of course, I'll take them. So as soon as I got home, I looked that up and yeah, sure enough, you can sell the lenses and, you know, I've got the paperwork showing they're authentic and they're brand new, obviously. And, you know, people will need replacement lenses for their sporty sunglasses. So one pair of the, I guess, factory glass lenses that come in the Ray-Bans sells for between 30 and $50 just for these little lenses. <laughs> so I had never been in that situation before because that's not something you'd really find in a thrift store. It's just random lenses. But anyway, so that nice pair of prescription sunglasses will end up costing me around a hundred dollars after I sell those lenses. So it's just, this is just a mindset. It's just, you know, either you're an entrepreneur or you're not either you think this way or you don't, because I can't help it. These thoughts just come into my head and that's just the way I'm wired. I don't even know how to explain it. So that is the something new I learned this week. Okay, and now it's time for the vocabulary builder. And 
the word this week is demitas, spelled D E M I dash T A S S E. It's a French word and it means half cup. And this refers to those little bitty, pretty, small coffee cups. So the actual definition is demi-tasse is French for half cup. This small coffee cup holds about two to three ounces. They are half the size of a regular coffee cup, hence the name half cup. It is a common misconception that demi-tasse cups hold or should hold one half of a measure of four ounces the name refers to one half coffee cup, and they're usually two to two and a half inches tall. Okay, let's go over the uses of demitasse cups. Demitasse cups are most often used to serve Turkish coffee, espresso, single shots, or double shots and other highly concentrated coffee drinks, such as Greek coffee. They may also be used for hot chocolate and other hot drinks in cafes, restaurants, and homes, though this is less common. Demitas cups most often appear in restaurants after dinner. They can be seen in many cafes and coffee houses throughout the day. Some people prefer to use French roast coffee rather than espresso roast or Italian roast coffee when serving espresso in a demi tasse cup. This gives it a more pronounced French influence. Since French roast coffee is a lighter roast than Italian or espresso roast, it will have slightly more caffeine. So there you go. Your vocabulary builder is demitas, not to be confused with demi more. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. And now for the main topic of the podcast Pandemic Aftershocks Part 3 How Back to School Will Be Different in 2021. Today's date is July 13th, and in the county where I live, school starts back on August 2nd. So that's three weeks from now. And we're already seeing some indications of back to school in retail stores with the shelves changing from summer and July 4th merchandise to back to school items. So back to school, whether it's homeschool or physically going to a public or private school or preschool or kindergarten or college is a regular marketing cycle in retail and usually includes the obvious things like paper supplies, notebooks, writing utensils, backpacks, items for younger students like crayons, glue, and for high school students, the lists include calculators, computer accessories, locker organizers, and so on. Now, I look for school and office supplies to sell on eBay all year because many are replenishable and will be needed all through the year. But there's definitely a buying surge during the late summer and early fall as kids all over the United States officially head back to school. Now in 2020, back to school was very different than any other year in modern history as some public and private schools were still doing virtual classes. Some schools had a hybrid system of in-person days and virtual at-home days. So it just depended on where you live and what your school system required. So here we are in July of 2021, 
And I think back to school won't ever be the same as it was pre-COVID. But once again, as resellers, we can look at change as opportunity and figure out how to position ourselves to take advantage of these opportunities. And remember, back to school means supplies for teachers, homeschooling parents, kids from preschool to college age, homeschool, as well as public and private school. The first advantage we have is actually two factors combined into one important factor. We sell online and we have the products in stock at our fingertips to ship immediately. This is a huge advantage for us because we can accommodate customers immediately. And I'll use the analogy of the powerful little tugboat that can move boats around that are a thousand times their size and they can maneuver in small spaces compared to the huge ships that aren't nimble and can't even turn around in some spaces. So we're like that powerful little tugboat. We're small and mighty and nimble and we can move fast. So here's a scenario. You may not think that Disney Little Mermaid backpack that has been sitting in your inventory for six months is going to be the answer to a mother's prayer for her six-year-old daughter who hates to go to school. <laughs> the little girl loves Ariel and wants an Ariel backpack, and that will just make mornings so much easier for mom if her daughter can have that backpack and be excited about carrying it and having it. And that'll just make mornings so much easier. But guess what? There are no Little Mermaid Ariel backpacks in the local stores. And maybe Amazon doesn't have it either. But there are a few on eBay. So guess where that mom is going to go to get that backpack? She's going to go look on eBay. So that her child will be happy. And her home will be happy because nobody likes grouchy kids trying to get them ready to go to school. Or another scenario, Amazon may not have all of the printer ink a teacher needs to stock her classroom. But five different eBay sellers have it in stock and can ship it out within 24 hours. That's the power of being a small seller, is you have what people need, and you can get it to them quickly. So I have a side note about that. Stores, retail stores, are still not fully stocked like they were pre-COVID. I personally think retailers like Kohl's, Target, and Walmart see that the bulk of their sales are now coming from the internet. They're keeping a large percentage of their inventory in warehouses so they can fulfill online orders quickly rather than shipping items to local stores to possibly sit on shelves for months. So they're keeping the bulk of their inventory on reserve in their warehouses so they can accommodate those online orders. And I've personally seen this situation with all sorts of items in the past few weeks, including clothing, small appliances, non-perishable food, and office supplies. I'll go online to order something and look at my local stores so I can drop by and pick it up if they have it, and the inventory level says zero, none in stock, none at this location. Or it may say one in stock, 
but I find that highly inaccurate because one usually means zero and the retailer system has not updated. So I just end up ordering it online anyway. So remember there is power in being a small seller because we have the items people want right at arm's length and we have the ability to ship orders sometimes the same day. As a small seller, we are more flexible. We can communicate more quickly and personally and we can accommodate a customer faster than a big company. For years, schools have been providing lists of supplies and you just order online. So the schools are encouraging parents to buy the items online and not even use the local stores. And my kids have been out of school for a while, but I remember they would even have kits assembled you know, go to this website and this is the third grade kit and it would have everything you needed and you just ordered the kit. So I think in 2021, this will be encouraged more than ever since retail stores just don't have the inventory. And I found an interesting article on a website called eSchool News, Innovations in Educational Transformation. And it's talking about how 2021 back to school is going to be different than ever before. So here's one point that I found interesting and applicable to eBay sellers. Remote learning has bolstered digital literacy among educators. Teachers will continue to use digital tools to enhance in-person instruction as students return to in-person school. The COVID-19 pandemic has created an unprecedented level of chaos for teachers and their students, requiring them to adopt new approaches to instruction and assessment and adapt to the uncertainty of changing parameters. Despite this, over the past year, we've seen educators rise to the challenges of virtual learning by focusing on finding new creative solutions to best support student learning. As a result, we've seen a huge shift in teachers' mindset about using digital tools. In a recent survey by some organization, uh, NWEA, 89% of teachers had little to no prior experience with virtual teaching going into 2020, yet nearly all teachers now expect to continue using digital tools at least some of the time when they return to more typical modes of instruction after the pandemic subsides. Looking to the 2021-22 school year, Educators are anxious to get back into the classroom with their students and will be taking this digital experience with them to further enhance teaching and learning. So digital literacy means knowing how to use technology for virtual learning. And a lot of this was figured out in 2020 during the height of the stay at home period. So What they learned, teachers and students, what they learned about virtual learning is now becoming standard. And everybody's a lot smarter about how to use technology for distance learning. So these items needed for distance learning may need to be replaced or upgraded for 2021 as teachers learn more about how to improve the technology or efficiency of virtual learning. So all of that means things like headsets, microphones, anything that has to do with being on the computer, props. They wouldn't have used in the classroom, but they're using it in their Zoom presentations, stuff like that. So 
it's just a different way to think about it, but everybody's a lot smarter about virtual everything <laughs> at this point. I mean, I wish I worked for Zoom in 2020 because um, you sure had job security there. Everybody was learning how to use it and their help desk was just slammed, I'm sure, with all these new users and people signing up to have a paid subscription. So anyway, I reached out to some of my teacher friends to ask them about how back to school for 2021 might be changing for them to get some insight on maybe some items that they would be purchasing for their classrooms. So the first person I reached out to is my cousin, Janet, who is a fifth grade teacher. And she said, uh, she's a teacher in a public school. Students now have individual Chromebooks and headsets are also provided. Our district will not be doing hybrid. All ours will be coming back unless they have a medical reason or doctor's note to learn at home. Last year was nuts as I taught 23 to 15 in classroom and eight at home Zooming at the same time. We're going to continue social distancing three feet and at the present I don't think we'll require masks as the governor says no, but our district is slow. I would say the biggest challenge post-COVID is that students no longer share supplies. In some classes like art and PE, they have to. We have plexiglass barriers in the office and supposedly we'll be getting those for teachers' desks. The students will not get these. So back to her comment about students now have individual Chromebooks and headsets are also provided. So that's for every student in the classroom. That's a lot of headsets. So you never know if people are going to Amazon to get these and they're out of stock, which is common. They could be going over to eBay to see what's available there. Okay, my next friend, Colleen, she replied with, in my middle school, I can no longer share pencils, markers, whiteboards, pencil sharpeners, etc. So we'll buy a lot of extras. The only thing different this year for our supply list is headphones. We did request parents to supply their kids with their own headphones. Our school has so much hand sanitizer that we removed it from the school supply list. I teach at a school where 98.5 are either free or reduced food, which means very low income, and it's a transient area. Sadly, some of my kids are in new schools two to three times a year. So there again, we have the headphones. That is an item on their school supply list that hasn't been there before. And then I asked Lori Beth, who is a teacher in South Carolina, and she said, I'm sorry, I'm not much help on that. I don't know what the protocol is yet. I'm anticipating pretty normal. We won't have any virtual students, and plexiglass was removed at the end of last year. So... All these school districts, counties, states are different. And then one more friend who is a substitute teacher. And she said that she's not going back because in some cases masks are still required. And she just doesn't want to do that. And, and I don't blame her. I mean, I just don't know how these people wore Masks all day long, you know, for eight, nine hours is just so suffocating. That must have just been terribly difficult for people. And I know my friend, the substitute teacher, has some health concerns. And it's, 
I do think she has some asthma or breathing problems. So that was just like, that was just not going to happen for her. So she's actually finding a different part-time job. She's not going back to the substitute teaching. And then I have um, a friend that some of you will know from the Facebook group, Shaney, who starts the Money Making Mondays post every Monday. She homeschools her boys. And so I asked her if anything was going to be different this year. And she said that they arranged a lot of spaces in their home to accommodate online learning, um, use a giant whiteboard and dry erase markers to keep up with online learning schedules, purchased lots of book, audio, and hardbound, oh, meaning like audio books and hardbound books. And then um, she said we used online cameras more than in the past. I can see a huge need for cameras and laptops. So uh, one last tip was I would also encourage monthly learning kits with supplies for doing science experiments or crafts. So that's the input from teachers out there. And I'm sure there are a lot of teachers listening to this that have more input, but I just wanted to get you all looking at the big picture about back to school this year and what might be different. So when you're out in the world and you see, you know, a bunch of headsets on sale at Walmart, it might be smart to pick some of those up to sell online for more than retail because I think there's going to be a shortage again. Once we hit back to school, these things are going to run out, you know, demand is going to be greater than supply and we're going to have that out of stock problem again. So I know that was a lot, <laughs> but I try to help you see the big picture. So here's my closing. This is Suzanne A. Wells teaching you how to do eBay the right way. You can find me on YouTube and Facebook under the same name. Be sure to follow me as new episodes are added every week. Be nice to each other. Make sure you're living the life you want and have a profitable and productive and fun day on eBay. Thanks for listening, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye.